It's a great pleasure and honor to be speaking at this special uh, uh, conference to celebrate 50 years of the PDB. Uh, I think we will not be where we are now uh, if there wasn't such a database that has been developed over the years. So in my talk, I want to uh, first uh, go shortly over my interaction with the PDB over the years, giving and taking. Then I will bring you to uh, solving 3D puzzles, describing a bit uh, <clears throat> the integrative modeling approach that we have been developing over the years, which makes, of course, uh, use of, of PDB resources. And at the end, a bit of uh, uh, scientific uh, content about moving into modeling membrane complexes. So first of all, interaction with PDB. Uh, I also looked up the statistic as did uh, Professor Rao, and I came up to about 50 entries in the PDB, which surprised me because I'm not, I'm not considering myself as an experimental person. I'm doing computational work in the middle of experimental people. But over the years, uh, my name is associated with about 50. So if I compare that to the previous speaker who was mentioning for, for about 480, that's it's about 10%. And if you look into the statistics of the PDB currently, about 7% of the total number of entries originates from NMR. So most of the structure I'm associated with are coming from NMR actually, but they're also having some crystal structure in there. But I'm doing apparently slightly better than the average uh, NMR contribution to the whole PDB, which is quite good in my opinion. Uh, the first structure at which I contributed was Crambin. So we saw that one in 91. And the second one was the arc repressor, which was a dimer. And actually those two structures are featuring on the cover of my PhD thesis uh, in 93. Uh, at the time I wrote a piece of software called Dinosaur for using NMR data directly to solve structures. So having contributed to the PDB over the years, then I'm feeling good about using the resources over the years. So that's the taking part of my interaction with the PDB. And a lot of what we have been doing in my group over the years uh, could not have been done if there wasn't a resource like PDB. Uh, just a few examples here. Um, we have been working on taking into account interfacial water, so the, the role of water in biomolecular recognition. And to do that, we extract the statistic, statistics from the PDB about the probability of finding a water molecule between two specific amino acids in complexes. Uh, we have also been uh, establishing several benchmarks. Uh, benchmarks are very important in, in computational fields to develop and test your methods to show that, uh, that you can do the job. And for this, of course, when you think of structural biology, you need structure. And this is where, again, the PDB is key. So this, is, uh, this, this story here is a benchmark for, uh, uh, which is used in a docking field, but also for binding affinity prediction, which is a contribution of several uh, groups worldwide. Uh, we published one about protein nucleic acids and very recently about uh, protein, uh, membrane protein complexes. So this will not have been possible uh, over the years. So the PDB has been a crucial resource uh, for all software development in the biomolecular field in general. And we've also been contributing to contributing because my group is developing software with Haddock being the most uh, famous one. And uh, I looked into the BDP, that's a modest contribution on the 165 entries listing Haddock as a software. So that's a, that's a small fraction. But if you look a bit into this, what you see on screen now, uh, most of those are actually complexes. And there's a good variety of structure. So you, you see obviously nucleosomes, you see protein nucleic acids, you see amyloid fibrils. So you see also small molecule protein protein complexes. And the majority of those will also be NMR based uh, uh, structures. But I will come back to the structural aspect of, of this kind of modeling. So this brings me now to the structural biology of interactions. So if we want to study molecular machine macromolecular complexes, uh, of course, the method of choice are the experimental method. If you, if you can get them to work um, with crystallography, EM these days, uh, big boost, and of course, NMR. And next to these methods that can provide you full atomistic uh, pictures of those molecules, there is a lot of other experimental methods. And this is by no means 
uh, no mean and uh, a full coverage of all experimental methods, but there are many methods that are providing you pieces of the puzzle. Mass spectrometry these days has moved into structural mass spectrometry. Uh, they can measure a lot of cross-linking distances, which start resembling uh, the early days of NMR. So you can use these distances to, to generate structure and build complexes. Uh, but a lot of methods. But when these methods are not sufficient to, to bring you the full picture uh, of those molecules, of those machines, and we have seen plenty of beautiful pictures in a previous talk, you need to move more into the, the digital world, the in silico world, and start combining computational approach together with maybe some experimental information to get to the 3D structure which we are after. And there are many different methods to generate structure. And the one that I want to focus on today is docking. And by docking, I mean solving 3D puzzles uh, in a computer. And you see a simple problem, two proteins, but many of the machines that we are interested in uh, will consist of more than two molecules. So we need to be able to describe more complex machines and to, to model them as well. But to this, just the basic principle is given the structure of two proteins or two biomolecules, can we predict how they associate? And this is a search problem in six dimension if we consider that the molecules are rigid. So we have to sample all the rotation of one of the protein and then translate for each rotation, translate it and measure the fit between the proteins using some kind of energy functions. And you see here electrostatics or charge interactions, and you see the Lennard Jones potential describing Van der Waals interactions. So this is a field which is about also actually 50 years, uh, pretty much, uh, well, a bit uh, younger than 50 years, probably it was the, the late 70s, early 80s, where the first docking software were, were created. Now, if you have data, you might want to guide this modeling process by incorporating the data directly into the computations. And there is a lot of experimental sources that are providing you such data. So I've always been working in the middle of experimentalists, of structural biologists, and the, the primary source of information which gave us the idea to move into this integrative modeling field uh, came from NMR, looking at complexes for which we could not solve the structure in a, in a classical manner, collecting distances between atoms, but we had information about the binding sites. And there are many more experimental methods that tell you something about the binding sites. They don't tell you how the binding takes place, but they provide you information. HD exchange experiments coupled to mass spectrometry, cross-linking again MS and more NMR data. Uh, so, well, say lower resolution shape information when cryo-EM does not reach a high resolution, which still happens, small angle scattering, and bioinformatics also very important with the explosion in sequence. This is also providing you information. So the idea is to combine this information together with docking or other modeling techniques to generate complexes. And we have been since more than 20 years now developing a software called Haddock. Uh, which is an integrative modeling platform where we can actually harvest a lot of this information that I just described to build models of those molecular machines. And one of the key aspects is that we can basically define the experimental information or transform the inf experimental information in some kind of energy function, which we take into the calculations to locate uh, the solution to the problem, possibly. Uh, one characteristic of ad hoc is that we can also model up to uh, 20 molecules currently. So a small intermezzo, uh, quite a few of you have discovered that there is a poll actually in the, in the meeting application where I asked a few questions. Um, and I just checked the results 15 minutes before my talk. So about one third of the participants present in this meeting, actually present in this meeting answered. So a lot of you uh, answered that when you think of ad hoc, you think of a fish, which is of course, uh, it is a fish, yes, but that's not the reason why we choose the name ad hoc. It's an acronym, um, but because it's a fish, it's an existing name and there's no copyright on the name. So we could use it. Uh, docking software already introduced, uh, introduced uh, the topic of docking. So the majority of you went for docking, meaning that uh, we have been doing good uh, PR over the years to, to brand the name of ad hoc. Uh, populating the PDB archive uh, a bit less. And uh, to me, coming from Europe, uh, very few answers knowing Captain Haddock. So I have to make a slight side move outside of structural biology and uh, a little bit of uh, 
comics uh, education, so I want to introduce you to Captain Haddock, Tintin's best friend. And this is Captain Haddock here that you see uh, together with Tintin. So may, I would say that many people should recognize this character figure. So this is, of course, copyright from Hergé Brunsard. And that's the reason, actually, why we choose the name Haddock. But since it was a fish, uh, we could use it without copyright uh, issues. So we have this checkbox. So these were all valid answers to the poll. I will come back to the poll a bit later. So how do we do all this modeling in Haddock? We have three stages. In the first stage, we treat the molecule as rigid bodies and we minimize the energy of the system. So here we have rock solid molecule. Then of course, since bar molecules are not rigid, but flexibility is an interesting part of their function. Um, and also the recognition mechanism, you need to optimize those interfaces. And at the end, we do a final minimization, adding some water to the system. So, how do we measure? So we don't generate one model when you do this kind of uh, modeling, but you generate uh, thousands of tens of thousands or more models. And then you have to decide which one is the most likely model. Uh, we do that using uh, some kind of score, which is a combination of different energy terms. One measures the van der Waals uh, and electrostatic interactions between the molecule. And if you have more than two molecules, you're going to sum up that over all interfaces. We have a term that accounts for the for the removal of water from the interface. That's a dissolvation term. And then we have a term that accounts for the experimental information that you put into the modeling process. Most of our users are actually accessing the resource through a web portal that we have been operating since 2008. And we have been serving, uh, we're getting close to 350,000 docking runs served uh, since 2008. And we can provide these kind of services because we have a strong support from European Open, open Science Cloud, but also uh, the Open Science Grid in the US, the high throughput compute resources. So the server is sending per year in the order of 25 million single calculations out. And we have a large user base, which you see here. So we have passed the cap of 22,000 registered users uh, with quite a number of so well. A lot of them in India, EU together, and then US as the third uh, leading uh, region uh, or the second country, if you count in that way. Now, uh, we just heard a fantastic talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2, and uh, we have also been noticing in the usage of our tools that uh, this is being used to model interactions. So a lot of our users starting actually what you see here, it's interesting, so you see here two waves which in Europe are mimicking kind of the infection waves. So the lockdown started in Europe in April and you see that people started doing more computing. They could not work in the lab anymore because they had to be at home and all of a sudden they were doing computing and we noticed that in a usage of our resource, both in a number of users using the service per month, but also in a number of submission. And since April, we have been tracking the number of COVID related submissions. You could say that Captain Haddock was actually foreseeing that. Uh, you see this picture of Haddock, uh, Tintin and the coronavirus. Uh, this is circulating on the internet. It's actually a combination of two uh, of, uh, of the book of Tintin. One is Tintin going to the moon and the other one is uh, the blue lotus, which happens in China. Now we are doing modeling. And when you are doing integrative modeling, you start doing modeling using some experimental data. And then we can ask ourselves, when does the model stop and the structure start? And you can try to search for an answer on the WWPDB website, you will not find it. One of the first model that we uh, solve with Haddock is uh, uh, E2E3 complex, UBCH5B04 uh, complex, uh, 1UR6, which came into the PDB, was deposited and you see it's, a, it's called NMR-based structural model of the complex. And on the RCSB side, the method is stated theoretical model. If I look at the PDB Europe side, this must be hidden somewhere else, so this is not showing. But this is classified as a model. And at the time, the annotators let it pass. And it's probably not the single, the only structure in a PDB which is annotated as model. Uh, I think the annotator let it pass because we are using distance restraints to guide the modeling process. So we transform this information about interface into some kind of distance, but it's no longer a distance between two points, but it's a distance between a residue on one side and a complete interface on the other side. So 
The question that you could ask here, should this model have been accepted in the PDB? And that's a question that has been raised by other depositors. Uh, and that's also one of the reasons why the PDB reacted to this kind of uh, models that are a bit of data, uh, a bit of computing to put together the hybrid integrative method task force. And Helen already pointed to that uh, in her talk. Uh, so a lot of the experts in the field and some of the speakers of today are also in this picture. So we met uh, in 2014 at the uh, EBI in Hingston in the UK to kind of define what should we do with those models, what should be deposited and how should we validate those models. So there was a paper that came out with a recommendation. So the, the PDB is reacting to, uh, to what's happening in the field, to the new developments in the field, and it works also as a catalyzator of those uh, developments. And as a result, we have uh, currently PDB dev, PDB dev as an archive where you can deposit models that are integrative model combining computations with uh, some kind of experimental data. So model that will not really fit in the classical PDB archive but which are also not fully theoretical model. They sit in between. And currently there's a, we have 60 entries in PDB dev and you see some of the early ones. So this is actually one of our model. And this is the beautiful pore complex from Andre Sally's lab. Uh, and since then more model have been added. And uh, also the, the software developers, we met again at a, in a meeting at the biophysical society meeting where we are trying to facilitate the deposition of these models to try to harvest a lot of information through the computing process to make the user life easier. Now, if we look uh, into the repository and I search for ad hoc, uh, there are actually currently 14 entries, which is say, about 25% of the entries in PDB dev are coming from Haddock. So we can add another check mark to the poll. It is a way to populate PDB dev actually, which only leaves us with I'm getting hungry. And it probably depends on the time zone in which you are. So we speak a lot about what is in the PDB, but we should also realize that what is not in the PDB is also a catalyzator for developments. So what I would call here the negative footprint of the PDB. The negative footprint of the PDB has been very important over the years. For example, in the CAPRI experiments, which stands for critical assessment of predicted interactions. And in CAPRI, uh, we have to blindly predict structure of complexes uh, for systems for which there is no information available yet in the PDB. So it's quite a strict uh, uh, selection of targets. So the PDB really here is our negative footprint. Uh, we do see over the years that more and more uh, templates become available in the PDB. So if you can find some kind of homology in terms of interface with something which is in a PDB, um, you can do quite a good job at molding those complexes. The number of real biological complex in a PDB is not that high. We have 177,000 entries in a PDB, but if you do a search and it's not a simple statistics to extract, so I have to think Samir from the PDB Europe for giving me the number, but currently there are probably about only 7,000 biological complexes in the PDB, which is a small fraction of the total. Another uh, important critical assessment which has benefited from basically the negative footprint of the PDB is CAS, because in CAS only models that are not in the PDB or that do not have a, a template in the PDB will be uh, uh, submitted and CASP has been running a, a bit longer than Capri, but both experiments really benefit from what is not in the PDB. Uh, so PDB plays both sides. What is in there and what is not in there benefits the community at the end in terms of catalyzing developments in the field. And of course, it was already mentioned uh, the achievement of Alpha Fold, DeepMind, but also of many other groups that are following similar steps could not have been achieved without a database such as the PDB. And this brings me to my last topic, which is a bit of, uh, of more recent science uh, about modeling uh, protein complexes of complexes of membrane proteins. Uh, membrane proteins uh, are much less represented in the PDB than, than the soluble proteins. They, they, cause, they have their own challenge in terms of uh, experimental studies. And you see that compared to all the proteins uh, which have been increased, so this is not going uh, up to, to, uh, to 
2021, but you can see that the number of protein is increasing extremely fast and the number of membrane protein is still is, is increasing, but not at the same speed as the, the regular protein. So there's still work to be done here. And hopefully cryo-EM will also contribute a lot to populating those uh, systems. Now, if you think of modeling membrane complexes uh, and, and the energetics, you will think that the interactions with the membrane will be governed by different energetics. Um, in print, well, the energetics is not different because nature has only one set of rules probably to guide all of molecular biology and of biology and life. Uh, the only problem is that we don't understand those rules properly or, or yet. If you think of proteins, you like to have hydrophobic residue in the inside, more hydrophilic charge residue on the outside. So water is basically guiding the way that protein falls. And if you think of interactions, it's often the case. But when you think of complexes, protein protein complexes, which are soluble, the interfaces of those complexes tend to be hydrophobic. Now in the membrane, uh, that will not generate a very specific interactions because the membrane is hydrophobic. You have the lipids there. So, so there must be other things. The other thing is that the membrane is also actually some kind of data because it imposes restriction on the possible orientation that the molecule can take inside the, inside the membrane. So this is in principle, some kind of experimental information that we could use in the modeling process. And most of the docking approach so far on the software have been uh, benchmarked and developed to handle soluble proteins, mainly again, because of the limitation in terms of structural data that were available in the PDB. Now, I already mentioned that we published a, a, a benchmark of membrane complexes, and we have been using that to, uh, to further develop our approaches. So one question that we had is, uh, can we actually make use of the topology of the presence of the membrane to guide uh, the demanding process? So even if you don't have any other experimental information, the knowledge that the protein sits in the membrane is a valuable knowledge. And we uh, have been uh, recently developing an approach that combines two software, LIDOC and HADOC. And this is the work of Jorge and Brian in my group. So LIDOC is actually a, a docking approach which is based on artificial intelligence following the glowworm SMARM optimizations. So if you know what your glowworms, they give light and usually they attract each other by giving light. In this optimization problem, again, you, you work with a large number of those worms uh, the light they emit is some kind of energy of interactions when you do your modeling. And by optimizing the swarm, you can locate quite efficiently uh, uh, the minima in your energy landscape. So, and we wanted to harvest the knowledge of the membrane. So what we are looking at in this case are complexes in which a soluble protein associate with a membrane protein. So we're not looking yet at membrane membrane association in this story. So we are taking the, the proteins and uh, we are taking uh, information from the memprop and the uh, database, which uh, collects uh, structural information of membrane proteins and build them in an equilibrated membrane. And they are both atomistic and uh, coarse grain representation. So we take this information. We only keep basically the phosphate atom of the lipid beads. And this is providing the starting point for our modeling process. Then using LIDOC and using the swarms, we place the swarm, we place the swarm on the region of the membrane, which is accessible by the soluble protein, which could be the intra or extracellular region. And you see here the starting position of the swarm and each of these points will have 500 of those glowworms that will be optimized to find the, uh, the, the right solution. Now, this is a rigid body docking software. It usually uh, generates quite some uh, clashes at the interface, uh, which is the region the reason why we then switch to ad hoc for refining those complexes. Now, this is a small benchmark. Uh, this is a subset of our uh, membrane benchmarks. These are the membrane protein slash soluble complexes. Uh, and they are different categories. And we have been benchmarking the performance. Uh, so the only information is basically the membrane information. What you see in gray will be the performance if you don't include this membrane information in your modeling process. And what is in color is the information or the, the performance that you get if you do include the membrane information. And you can, without understanding what I'm showing you, you can click directly see that there's a large improvement because higher is better, it's a success rate on the Y axis. And on the X axis, what you're looking at is the number of models that you will be looking at. So if you only take the first model that your modeling approach gives, what's your success rate? It's not fantastic. 
Okay, we still have a hard time to model protein complexes and there are plenty of things that we can improve. But if you look, for example, at the top five or top 10 predictions, you see that we are reaching for uh, overall for all the complexes about 60% success rate. Uh, which means that in this kind of modeling, we always need to go back to some kind of experimental validation, which could be doing some mutagenesis, some biochemical assays to, to validate those models. Now, the way that we declash the model, because I mentioned there is a lot of clashes in those models, is uh, to make use of a recent uh, development in ad hoc where we have been building the a coarse grain approach to basically simplify the description of proteins going from atomistic to coarse grain, doing the docking at the coarse grain level and moving back to at atomistic. But in this case, the docking was done with LIDOC, so we only actually use this final stage to refine uh, the structure. Uh, this is uh, showing you how well this uh, final stage works. Uh, in red will be a lot of clashes. These are all the benchmark cases and green will be a small number of clashes. And you see that in all cases, you go from interface that have a lot of clashes to interface that have been highly refined. So in this combination of LIDOC, which is uh, an efficient uh, optimization uh, docking software and ad hoc, uh, we have a, a way of describing, incorporating the membrane information into the modeling process. And it allows to uh, incorporate also additional data to the process. Now, in terms of perspective um, and uh, the, also the web portal, we have realized that actually the or, or complex machinery behind ad hoc is already able to handle explicitly membrane system. And these are actually users that have been pushing the limit of our server. This was not doing us doing those trials, but users came with problems and try things. And, and sometimes it works and it surprises us. And you see here one uh, system where uh, using NMR data, uh, a group tried to look at the binding of a protein to a nano disk. And this was given to the server and this was working. And this is an example of giving such a membrane embedded in a lipid bilayer and docking a small molecule to it, and the server actually is able to do that. So we have a way already, but this is work in progress to possibly explicitly account for the membrane during the modeling process. Now, where are we going? And by we, I don't mean uh, uh, ad hoc, but just the field of integrative modeling. And what this picture is showing you is uh, uh, my interpretation of, of uh, integrative modeling. So you see this kind of funnel, you see uh, MS machines, uh, you see a cryo -EM machine here, you see biochemical work, NMR, uh, say high throughput assays, you see some computing all together. And what you're seeing here is not a single snapshot of a structure. So we're looking here at the uh, 50 years of PDB protein complex, but we're looking at a movie of this system as function of time. So we are speaking about molecular machines. Machine consists of pieces, of moving pieces. So we need to be able to, to basically solve the structure of the pieces in different states. And we have seen that in a previous talk as well. So, but we also need to add the time dimension to this, uh, this entire machinery to know how the pieces are moving in which and at which speed, because only then will, be, will we be understanding how those machines work. So we need to consider states, we need to consider time dynamics. And also we need to consider that this energy or structural landscape that we're looking at is also not static because events in the cells are going to rewire the landscape, change its energetics, change its dynamics. So it's a very complex landscape and that's very much a challenge also to the PDB and over database to capture this very complex data. With that, I want to finish by thanking the people who are contributing to everything that I'm telling you. So this is uh, our current group meetings. Um, I want to acknowledge funding from the Dutch uh, Research Council and from various European projects over the year, in particular BioExcel and EOS Hub. The software developers over the years, former group members um, for their contribution and you for your attention and to check the final mark in the poll. For those who of you who are angry, I have a nice birthday cake uh, to share with the PBE, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Very, very good. And I think uh, you capture 
the future about where we're trying to go. So there are, we're rather short of time, but I'll ask, there are two very short questions that have been asked. First of all, is Haddock a free software? So Haddock is a free software uh, for non-profit usage. We are working in the context of the BioXL European project in a new version, which is completely free. It's very experimental and completely redesigned. The only catch is that for running ad hoc, you need CNS and CNS was falling under Yale licensing and Yale sold the rights to the DASO group. So it's BioVia who owns the license. BioVia doesn't sell CNS anymore. They don't support it anymore. They still collect the money. So for industrial usual usage, it's a bit of a, you can get it. They allow you to use a nonprofit, but then you need to have some of their product. Yeah. And, and lastly, how does Light Doc and Haddock work in the benchmark compared to Haddock alone? So we only benchmark Haddock in the, for the membrane case, we did a benchmarking without accounting for any of the structural information of the membrane given by the topological information of the membrane. Um, so, so there it's not doing as, uh, as good, especially if you have no information. If you have the, you could put in the knowledge of the loops, which are the extracellular loop, and this is already making things much better. And currently we are uh, working on explicitly including the membrane in the molding process so that we are docking basically a membrane protein embedded in a lipid bilayer. Yeah. So that's work in progress. Work in progress. So thank you very much as always. Brilliant presentation, Ali. Thank you.